now that we understand everything there is to know about cellular respiration, I think it's very important that we take a step back and just look at everything we've just done. We've covered a lot of information, a lot of details, but the most important things, the most highly examined things, let's say, are going to be summarized in this final summary video of aerobic respiration. And that's what the title of our final flowchart. Um, it's not even a flowchart, more so than just a summary of everything that we've done through a couple of different formats, which I'll show you. Summary of uh, aerobic respiration. Everything we've just done is considered aerobic respiration. Overall, first of all, let's take a step back and look at the very first thing we talked about. Um, C6H12O6 is what? It's glucose. And where does glucose come from? It comes from our food. It's broken down through our digestive system and eventually we get glucose within our bloodstream that enters our cells via GLUT1 receptors. So glucose, and we also breathe something, right? We breathe oxygen, six molecules of oxygen, are going to give us, through the cell respiration process, six molecules of carbon dioxide, um, also six molecules of H2O, and then also energy. Now it's finally time to put a number to this. And everybody always talks about this, how much ATP do we make? It's a famous number. Um, people always uh, say maybe 36 or 38. I'm actually going to show you today that this number should actually be closer to uh, about 30 molecules of ATP. And we'll see why as I go through the calculation itself. And that's something you should understand as well. So this is our overall equation. This is what we've proved. If you go back to um, through all the videos and look at this equation as you go through every single video, you'll see that we cover every single part of this as we go through cellular respiration. So overall, um, the big question that we're asking in this video, this final video, is how much ATP? Because that's a good way to summarize everything. How much ATP did we create? I sort of spoiled it for you by saying 30, but now I'll prove to you why it's 30. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a very simple chart. I'm going to say that in glycolysis, in the pyruvate oxidation, and also in the citric acid cycle, we had created some things. We created ATP, we created NADH, and what was the other thing we created? We created FADH2. So this is our very simple uh, chart that we're going to create. Oops, let me try to make that a little bit straighter. Okay, got to keep the hand straight. Okay, perfect. So, we've created these things, okay? So now, in glycolysis, if you go back, we created four molecules of ATP, but remember, we invested two, so we ended up with only two molecules of ATP total. In NADH, um, we've created glycolysis. In, through glycolysis, we created NADH, but I want you to remember that we created two of them, but specifically, where did glycolysis occur? It occurred in the cytosol. That's going to be an important fact later on when we talk about the sort of value of the NADH that we've created in the cytosol. And FADH2, we did not create anything. During pyruvate oxidation, if you go back, no ATP was created. There were two molecules of NADH created, but again, where were they created? They were actually created now finally in the mitochondrial matrix. Um, let's just oops, get that out of the way. And now we have zero also molecules of FADH2. And then lastly, in the citric acid cycle, how many molecules of ATP? There were two molecules of ATP created. Um, there were six, uh, all of them created in the mitochondrial matrix of NADH, and actually two molecules of FADH2. These were also created in the mitochondrial matrix. The reason why you need to remember this is because it plays a role in the value that we put to the NADH respectively or the FADH2 respectively in terms of how much ATP they're worth. So overall, I just want to do sort of a total right over here. Uh, the total ATP that we've created um, and what's the last step that we're actually missing? We're of course missing um, the electron transport chain and that's done on purpose. So right now, we've created a total of four ATP molecules, we've created a total of 10 NADH molecules and two FADH2 molecules. What I want you to do now is sort of basic calculation. How do we value these 10 ADH molecules and how do we value these two FADH2 molecules? Because all we've done so far is created four ATP and I told you we need to get to 30. We need to create a value for these molecules right over here. What, is these, what are these 10 NADH molecules worth? What we do is we now go to the electron transport chain and specifically we look at um, oxidation that happened at the electron transport chain. And these, both of these molecules, NADH and FADH2, were oxidized during this process. What is oxidation? Oxidation is loss, loss of electron. These guys donated that electron, let's say, to the complex one or two respectively. And so what happens is, if you have NADH and it comes from 
Um, let's say um, if it's from the mitochondrial matrix, you actually value it at um, 2.5 ATP. It's equal to the value of 2.5 ATP. So any NADH that came from the mitochondrial matrix, it's valued at 2.5 ATP, and that gives us a value total of this. So there are actually eight of them that came from the, from the mitochondrial matrix. Six over here from CAC and two from pyruvate oxidation. So that's eight times 2.5 ATP molecules. That gives us how many? That gives us 20 ATPs total. But again, I'm skipping something. I'm skipping the ones that came from the cytosol. This is actually interesting because if it's from cytosol, if the uh, NADH is from the cytosol, you actually only value it at 1.5 ATP. You might be asking, oh, well then, aren't they the same molecule? How are you giving them two different um, values? If you remember, in order to go from the cytosol to the mitochondrial, uh, let's say, um, inner membrane, because that was the next step, we actually had to undergo active transport. We actually had to put in some metabolic energy. And that's what I'm doing here. I'm actually accounting for the metabolic energy that was uh, needed for this NADH, which had to go eventually to the mitochondrial inner membrane. And it needed some energy to do this in order for it to go from the cytosol to the mitochondrial membrane. Go back to the previous video, uh, previous videos, and you'll see that this process happened. So I'm accounting for it. I'm giving it less value because I had to actually use some energy to get to the mitochondrial matrix. And now I can multiply this um, by 1.5, two molecules obviously from the cytosol, and this gives us how many um, ATP molecules? Two times 1.5, three ATP. So you can say that the NADH is responsible for 23 ATP molecules. It only has this discrepancy because one of two of those NADH molecules had to travel from the cytosol to the mitochondrial membrane, and that was an active process. It required some energy, so you can't say that all the NADHs are equal. As far as FADH2 is concerned, they were all made in the mitochondrial membrane, a mitochondrial matrix, excuse me, and they are all equal, but in this situation, it actually is only worth 1.5 ATP. Um, so what we say is we've created two of these uh, FADH molecules, so two times, uh, we have, yeah, two FADH2 molecules worth 1.5 ATP each, so that creates three ATP molecules total. So now, how much molecules of ATP have we created from the electron transport chain? From the electron transport chain, from ETC, we've created 23 plus 3, which is equal to 26. From glycolysis, how many uh, molecules of ATP have we created? Let's go back. Glycolysis gave us two molecules of ATP, two. And then from the citric acid cycle, how many molecules of ATP? Two. And this gives us how many? 26 plus 2 is 28, plus 2 is 30 molecules of ATP, just like I promised you right over here. 30 ATP molecules, 30 ATP molecules, and that's through this calculation. You should be familiar and comfortable with this calculation because you will be asked in some way, shape, or form how the 30 came about. What was the reasoning for it? Or maybe even why are not all NADH molecules not equal? What is the reasoning for that? And this is the reason that we've explained through here. So one last final thing that we'll talk about um, for today on this lecture series on cellular respiration is um, where did uh, the 36 or 38 come from? Where 36 slash 38 ATP? Um, remember how in your high school textbooks you would always say, oh, you make 36 or sometimes even 38 ATP? Why is that? That's actually because um, a lot of the st earlier studies of... Um, let's say cellular respiration, were actually prokaryotic. And these earlier studies assumed and knew that prokaryotic cells, they have no mitochondria. If they have no mitochondria, um, they have all aerobic respiration, all aerobic respiration um, occurring in the cytosol. This basically means that everything is happening in one place. The electron transport chain is literally on the plasma membrane of a prokaryote. There's no movement necessary from one part to another. There's not this idea of going from the cytosol to the mitochondrial membrane ever. There's nothing needed to be moved. Everything happens on one plain, even field. So that basically means you get a higher ATP yield because you never have to travel. You never have to invest energy in any type of active transport. Everything's just happening. And another reason you can say that we sometimes say 36 or 38 ATP 
even this number, 30 ATP is kind of high. These are ideal, perfect numbers that we imagine happening if every single step of glycolysis, if every single step of uh, pyruvate oxidation, if every single step of citric acid cycle and ETC, all 30 steps and 30 enzymes work up to capacity, work up to their complete potential. And we know that in nature, that doesn't always happen. There are circumstances that are going to cause differences in the ability for something to work, like stress or maybe just being not feeling well or feeling sick or something like that. So these are all sort of extreme sort of best case scenario ATP values. Overall, we understand this equation. This is the most important thing of, I think, biology one altogether is the idea of cellular respiration. Just be thankful that this process occurs every single day in every single one of your cells without you having to think for even one second about the reduction that has to occur or the oxidation that has to occur within this pro within this uh, equation. It's just something beautiful to me and amazing to me, and I really, really enjoy teaching it. I hope you learned uh, cellular respiration and respiration thoroughly and completely. Thank you.